welcome to the joy of coding. Hello, and welcome to episode 265 of the joy of coding. My name is Mike Conley. It's so good to have you here. Gonna be hacking on some live, but little, little, gonna be live hacking on some Firefox stuff today. You'd think, having said this, like this exact same sentence, going through this exact same ritual for like four years, I'd have it down pat. It'd be like muscle memory, but still, my mouth will sometimes trip over the words. We're gonna be live hacking on some Firefox stuff. It's gonna be great. We're gonna be looking at uh, some patches. We're gonna review and we're gonna investigate some test intermittent test failures, which you know it's always good to hammer those out. Uh, let's, let's get started. Let me start by sharing my screen. So there is a preamble that I generally do for the joy of coding. Uh, if you're a long time viewer, you will be familiar. Uh, the idea, the first one is that no plan survives breakfast. I think I know what I want to do today. I think I have a sense of where this episode is going to go, but it might, I might be wrong. <laughs> you know, like I, we're kind of improvising as we go. I have a vague timeline but you can think of me as almost as like um i used this metaphor the other day like a or an analogy the other day like a dis an easily distractible tour guide so if there's something that we see like that's very interesting that you know i hadn't originally planned on checking out we might pull over and like take a closer look just because i'm easily distracted so that's the first thing no plan survives breakfast things might go wrong might get stuck we might figure stuff out we might not that's okay second thing is that there is a, an agenda that we're looking at oh the sound is it just me or the sound is in mono right is that is that the case are people only experiencing the sound in one ear that's what danny colin is saying um i don't think i've changed any of my sound settings and i don't actually think that there's stereo output on this on this thing uh let me just quickly check real quick one moment one moment uh, audio capture monitor off it's mono it's mono this is a mono track going out yeah it could be the same for me says smurf d oh no obs is is like sending out a mono track i don't know why you're only getting it in one ear uh, i apologize <clears throat> i don't know what's going on there um but i don't know if there's anything i can do to fix it but we'll we'll check it out We'll check it out after maybe after the episode i'll listen to the recording and see whether or not there's something i can do on my side it might depending on where you are uh maybe if you're watching this on twitch try the youtube channel the youtube stream um because there are multiple streams and i wonder if it's stereo over there or if it's in both both ears okay uh the agenda so uh what we're looking at right here in front of us is an agenda it's got like lots of handy dandy links uh, apparently on Twitch it sounds fine, says Juge Machine. Okay, that makes me feel better. It makes me think that maybe the issue is not on my end. Maybe the issue is on YouTube's end or on Twitch's end or whoever. The endpoint's end. So that makes me feel better. Um, the agenda is something that you have access to. If you're watching this on YouTube, for example, check out the video description for a link. If you're watching this on Air Mozilla, it'll be in the video details to my left. And if you're watching this on uh, Twitch, then let me quickly just drop the Twitch chat, uh, the a link into the Twitch chat. Wow, all it took was one week off and my entire ability to speak extemporaneously, completely shot. Uh, so there you go, that's, that's the agenda. That's the first thing. The second thing is there is an episode guide. It is a completely viewer-driven episode guide. You, you should check it out. If you wanna know what I've done in previous episodes, maybe you wanna add your own notes, addenda, corrections, maybe you wanna expand on something. Maybe you too are an easily distracted tour guide and wanna like kinda go off on a tangent about a thing that I touched on in a, in a previous episode or in this episode when the episode guide shows up. You can contribute. If you're not sure what a pull request is or a repository, there's a guide here on what that's all about. Um, and and if you are familiar, if you're more comfortable with using a uh, you know pull request and repository, go to the GitHub uh, where I'm hosting the the episode guide. You can send a pull request and and I'll add your changes in. Okay, so what are we doing today? Now that we've gotten over the sort of the ceremony, the 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 beginning of the the stream what did we what are we doing today well the first thing i wanted to do was take a look at a patch that someone had sent me to review and i wanted to show you what that's like whenever i'm reviewing a patch i have not looked at this patch at all i just saw that it ended up in my review queue and uh i don't know what this bug's about i don't know what this patch is about i haven't even i've been averting my eyes i was just like oh this thing just showed up so you're about to see uh you're about to see what happens whenever i like i just see it 
and I've never seen it before. Like I, I, I'm not, I haven't even read it yet. I haven't, I'm looking at my monitor. I don't even know what's on my screen. So I'm going to look right now. Here we go. What's this about? Hiding about tab crashed should hide extra fields by default and let it be opened with a toggle. Uh, okay. And it looks like what happened was today I was redirected. Someone redirected me to this review request. And it sounds like I'm a mentor on this bug. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I'm, I'm a mentor on this bug. It looks like there have been a number of different stabs at this. Uh, what is, I have to sort of refresh my memory about what this is about. <clears throat> okay, let's start from the top. This was filed six years ago by, uh, by, uh, Felipe Gomez. The form asking the user to provide extra information like email, comments, etc. and about tab crash is tied to the same toggle that lets users decide whether to submit the report at all or not. In order to not let that discourage users from submitting the report, the two options should be untied, and the form asking for extra info should only be shown if the user chooses to. So let's take a look at, like, this was filed back in the day, like six years ago. Let's take a look at what this looks like now. I've got a build here, a recent build of Firefox. What I'll do is I'll go run, knock, run, and then with local builds, you actually have to do something special if you're dealing with crash reports or the crash report. You have to enable the crash reporter by default. That's actually something that shows up in the help of uh of mock run and the reason for that is because like we disable it by default for local builds because usually local build crashes are not interesting um because if you built it locally chances are you've made some modifications and so the symbol server won't have symbols so like accepting the crash report from a custom build of firefox is usually uh useless but in this case we actually do want to see the crash reporter interface um so what we'll do is you can go to any page. I'm going to show you a trick on how you can uh, cr easily, quickly and easily crash a, a, a tab for testing. I believe it's about crash content. If you do that, it will crash the tab. Now, actually, what I wanted to do was not crash the content and just show this. I wanted to show the crash reporter form. So let's go back to where we were just now. Um, what we need to do is we actually have to kill this content process five two nine four uh so ignore what i just said about going to crash content that's good not, not that's not good enough you gotta go a bit further um so the process id was five two nine four and the way i crash it as i say sig abort five two nine four that should crash the tab now what's interesting is i'm still not getting the form where is the form Huh. Is the crash reporter is the crash reporter on? Surfaces crash crashes? Is there like a crash manager? Crash What's the uh enabled? Is there some kind of UI for determining whether or not the crash reporter is enabled? Or user interface or API or something? How do I find out whether the crash reporter is enabled or not? There is a crash manager. Is that what it is? Crash. Yeah, the enabled status of the crash reporter. I want this thing. How do I get at the crash reporter interface? Is it on services? It is not. So I have to like like get an instance of it myself. Crash manager. So here's the crash reporter. Crash reporter dot enabled. False. So it's passing and that's the reason why the form's not showing up is that for some reason saying enable crash reporter was not enough. Did I spell it right? Oh, I got to put a dash. I got to put a dash in between. That's why I didn't pass the right flag. That's what was going wrong. Okay, so maybe now if I go to uh, about crash content. Yeah, now we get the form. Okay, okay. Here, that, that makes more sense. Okay, so what uh, 
what has happened is like this the style has somewhat changed in this page if we compare the two screenshots of, of like before and now the icon is gone here let me try and like put these side by side so we can kind of get a sense of it the the strings have changed um there was a checkbox outside here to submit a crash report and it looks like we hide show and hide some fields whenever we say to like submit the crash report uh so some of this is the same now what what was being suggested in here is some way of providing more details so like send it on a crash report and then like making it so that the user can opt in to provide more details so rather than like overwhelming them with more um like more fields to fill out we just try and encourage them to like yeah send the crash report because uh, crash reports are really useful for us they, they help us we want users to send them because they help us make the browser more like stable okay so this went through a whole bunch of a bunch of like iterations and then i was working with a volunteer contributor and it didn't i think they ended up like not getting very far and then uh oh you know what? i'm I, I feel really bad it looks like there were a bunch of people who've been trying to like do stuff on this And like, for some reason, I've it's just not been showing up in my like. It's either it's in the my review uh, my need info backlog, and these messages I haven't been seeing them, or they just not been surfaced to me. So I feel really bad because there are a bunch of volunteer contributors here who have like reached out and I didn't say anything. So if you're one of these people, I apologize. Um, that's not cool. So let's take a look at what the uh, so someone actually just ended up picking this patch uh, this this up and submitting a a patch and I'm curious to know what it looks like so let's uh, let's just go ahead and apply it and see what it does. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and quit. We're gonna apply the patch with mozfab patch. Okay, we're gonna build it. Scooby Doo, and then we'll run it. Oh, we gotta run with enable crash reporter. Sorry, it's not the default. So let's try that again. Uh, enable crash reporter. Okay, so let's go to some page and then we'll go about crash content. So it looks like some kind of a button was added here. Um, I think I see what they're saying. Like by default, we'll, we'll hide some this thing, this additional form fields. What is that? Is that a pixel there? Is there something? There's something splits on my screen, I think. Yeah, okay. But there's no, there's like the strings are broken on here. That's one thing worth pointing out. A lot of stuff's broken. Okay, so we need to clean this up. Uh, targets, more details. An ID, data more details. Checkbox. Looks 
like just a space was added there. It looks like a hard coded string ended up going in here. That we can't do that. We can't can't do that. Okay. Okay. Hold up. Hold up. Hold up. So what do we want to do here? So I'm not a fan of using this down arrow from like the Unicode for provide more details. I think what we probably want, I'm trying to think what this should look like. Um, whoops, didn't mean to open slicer. No, 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 go away. Go away, force quit, go away. Um, let's restore the tab. We'll go back to crash content. What should this look like? Be like, provide more details. almost like a tree arrow is what the original screenshot was trying to or the original was trying to allude to is like a, a twisty we kind of have stuff like that inside of our um, inside of our bookmarks toolbar like if you go to here um, do we have twisties yeah like we have these sorts of things I wonder if we should reuse this sort of metaphor where it's like a button with a down to expand, collapse. And we also have these twisties here. You could use these. But that's if there's like a tree of information. And I think this might be better. So something like, um, what would this look like? Let's. Let's go to about crash content again here. Let's just hand decorate this. Um, uh, provide more deep. What? Come on. Provide. What's the string supposed to be? Provide more details. How about text content? Is that? Provide more detail. Okay, well, first of all, way too big. Way too big. Um, and this button, the margin, what, what's wrong with it? The margin on its left, we probably want it to be inline start zero. We probably want the font size to not be 1.5 rem. Do we want the padding to be 14? Hmm. Do we have examples of us having icons in buttons in any of our in content pages? That's the other thing to think about. Like, do we, in about preferences, do we We've got drop downs like that. But like if we choose to show more. We have these. But we don't have any text inside them. What are these? Those are buttons. The background image? How's that's inherit image? 
button class arrowhead. Interesting. I don't know if I'm allowed to use class arrowhead. Um, above all, we should try not to invent new things here. We should try and reuse pre-existing like patterns. So what comes to mind is Use enable disable. I wonder if this should be a checkbox. Let's have more details. An off by default checkbox. Unless the user, we can remember. If a user has set this before, we can remember that they like to provide more details. And we can keep it open. <clears throat> I think, I think that's why I'm gonna recommend. There are a number of issues with this patch. Um, it's a good stab, but we should, we should, We should rethink this. Um, so first of all, we should thank our, our contributor. Hi, thanks for working on this. I think uh, I have some suggestions. Uh, thanks for working on this and dusting off the old patch. Now that I've had some, now that I've had a chance to come back to this problem, I think a button isn't really the right solution here for the toggle. Instead, what I, I suggest is that we use a checkbox instead. Uh, it looks like this. Um, okay, I need to go to the, we're gonna, we're basically gonna try and mock up, mock up what I think it's supposed to look like, or what I think it should look like. Like, hopefully users aren't seeing this tab crash page too often. That is the ideal, it is like in the best case scenario, people never see this thing. But when they do, we want it to be friendly and useful uh, and not scary. And we want to com like sort of, we want users to feel confident that they can send us information to help us make things better. So let me start by taking a screenshot of this. And then uh, let's drop it into Krita. Uh, and I'm, let me switch over to here. Okay. So what I'm thinking we should do, and I've never used Krita like this before with a mouse, so this might be a really interesting exercise. But I think what I want to do is like move all of this down a bit. Um, hang on. How do I move? Can I just move like no? How do I move a region? Is there like, there we go. Now I wanna move a region, but stick to the vertical. Yep, shift will do it. We're gonna create some space there. Then what I wanna do is I wanna copy this style right here, this sort of like thing. We're gonna paste it and we're gonna move it 
and we're going to create like we're going to create a lengthening here of this uh there's probably an easier way of doing this but i want to like fill this gap hang on hang on believe believe i think i got it uh let's make sure let's go a little bit lower actually i want to make sure i don't get any of the bottom uh text or the bottom of the checkbox come on what so easy to like accidentally is it snapping is that what it's doing yeah it's like okay i'm just not used to where Krita places the it's the top left of the you'd think it'd be the middle of the crosshair but it's like the top left of the crosshair is Krita snapping snap show pixel grid snap image bounds snap image center i'm going to turn snapping off There we go. I was wondering what was going on there. I'm like, man, that thing is, I am way more precise than I thought, but I'm very good at choosing the wrong region. That's what I thought was happening. Okay. Uh, paste. Again, I'm not an expert at Krita. I'm still like learning it. And uh, oh man, that is a smaller region than I thought. What's going on here? What are my layers? Merge all. Merge. Merge all. I like come on, flatten image. Let's let's do this. I want just this. And now I'm gonna move like this. You're watching an amateur. This is amateur hour, folks. But that's okay. Merge. Merge. Flatten image. And now again paste. Whoops paste and we're gonna ah paste there there we go okay so we've at long last we've created this gap that's what i wanted um and what i want to do is i want to copy this checkbox um really just this checkbox and We'll say like some text that says something like uh, merge or flat image. All right, I don't need layers right now. I'm not doing anything super fancy, but I am gonna write some text here that says, "Wow, I've never had this interface up here." Provide more details, and what font will I use? I'll use Enter if I have it. Save, close, provide more details. Right? And so the idea being that when it's checked, we'll show these fields. And when it's not checked, we'll hide the fields. And if the user fills out these fields and then unchecks them, we should like keep the fields populated, but not send the information because the user is like opted out of sending stuff when they say don't provide the details. Well, I see some traffic. Can't you use the standard strict or custom ones and about preferences and privacy? You can probably move the select. What's the problem of always showing the optional comments text area instead of hiding it? I mean, do they really scare users from submitting crash reports? I guess doing A-B testing would give us more data. I think the idea is that like, this is already really overwhelming. The user has just experienced uh, like the worst thing, which is a crash of the browser. And like, we're trying to apologize a little bit. And then we're trying to like, um, we're, we're trying to make them feel comfortable sending us more information. The less we can intimidate them and overwhelm them with choices, the better. Uh, when you give them too many things to fill, it almost feels uh, feels like you're doing your taxes. If you got all these fields, like this says optional, but if a user sees all these things, they might be like, ah, oh, to hell with it. And they just like close the tab or just close the browser because they, they lost their session. Because you have to remember, a user who has just experienced this is probably very frustrated. They just lost work. They lost their state. They're in no mood to be trifled with. They're, they are probably very upset. So we want to treat them gingerly with respect and we want to get out of their way. 
So, you know, try and reduce how much we're showing them right off the bat, be helpful, but you know, don't overwhelm them with a bunch of choices when they're in that vulnerable position. Uh, so this image that we are, uh, this image, oh, I, I just realized I was pointing at the wrong thing. I should have been pointing at this. Um, but this is what I'm going to paste, uh, into the bug, into bugs, into uh, fabricator actually. So let me go back to fabricator. Uh, so I can paste that image in here. That checkbox can then be, uh, can that, here's how I envision this behaving. One, the checkbox checked state is used to show or hide the uh, text area and the include the URL of the page I was on. Because that's the other thing, include the URL of the page I was on. The term URL is already like, there's a significant proportion of your audience where they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. What is a URL? And, you know, I don't know if I want to include a URL. I'm scared about URLs. Like, I don't know what, like, and they're not in a mood for us to be like, okay, well, let's teach you what a URL is. Like, we should, um, we should try and get out of their way if best we can in this very specific situation. Uh, show or hide the text area and the include the URL uh, of the page I was on checkbox. Um, if the checkbox is not checked, then when the uh, form, uh, when any uh, information, then the text area contents, if there are any, or URL checkbox state should be cleared before submission. I.e., if a user chooses to provide more information, fills out the fields, and then changes their minds by unchecking provide more information, provide more details, we should honor that choice to not provide those details. Okay, um, what else? We should remember if the user provided more details in the past, and if so, have the provide more details um, checkbox checked. Uh, that way, if a user is comfortable sending more details, we they don't have to keep opting into it every time. Uh, what else? Uh, so on top of that, um, I have a few other notes about the patch as it currently stands that will also apply to the uh, next iteration that fits the requirements above. Okay, so let's see here. Options display none. And then it looks like what they were doing was having like more details like, like using script to set display block. What I'm going to suggest is um, more details options. What we can do is we can like 
does this need to be inside of a div? Toggle container with text. Yeah, I guess it does. Um, I believe we can just use the hidden attribute to hide and show things. Like if I am in here and I say like uh, this options list, I'm gonna say hidden equals true. Yeah, you can just you can just do that. That's the thing that we get for free. And so you, that means you can go like hidden equals true. Yeah, hidden equals false. So that's what I would recommend doing instead. Uh, what I would recommend uh, instead of using display none and display setting display equals block in script, there's a better way of, there's a more idiomatic, I'll say, of showing and collapsing content what we do is use the hidden attribute on the node. So for example, on the uh, UL IAB equals options node, I think that's what it's called, UL ID equals options node, you could modify it to be UL ID equals options, hidden equals true to hide it by default, and then a reference to the node can be used to show it by using the associated hidden property, like like this JS, what was it? Uh, options. document options that hidden equals false. Okay. Um, we kind of, we kind of do that with the request email field as well, which is strange. Like uh, this request email field, I think we removed it by default. This field has been removed, has been removed uh, in uh, the most recent versions of the uh, about tab crash page and we shouldn't reintroduce it. We used to ask users for their email address. Shouldn't reintroduce it. But um, but we don't do that anymore. Terrible. Why are we going back to checkbox with label? Some new style. Uh, this looks like an older version, uh, like some unrelated changes that actually revert us back to an older uh, set of conventions for this page. Can you please revert this? Um, same with this. Uh, and it's not just conventions. I reverse back to an older set of conventions and a no longer existing string. Please revert. All right. We can't uh, put in hard-coded strings like this. Um, and I don't believe, send it on a crash report so we can fix issues like this. Is that? I'm not sure where that string came from. Uh, I don't believe we need, we need to set this string. The string provided by crashed send report to is fine. Um, uh, 
let me know if you have any questions about how to proceed. Thanks. So I'm going to request changes. We'll also probably, we'll also need to have tests, write a test for this uh, change, but I can guide you there when uh, we're done adding the checkbox. All right, and there we go. So yeah, I mean, it, it, we're adding yet another checkbox, but what it's gonna look like is like, I can probably just hack together a version of what this would look like. Um, it's gonna look like, provide more details. It's gonna look like that and then what I'll do is uh, input checkbox. Um, add event listener change e document get element by ID options dot hidden equals e dot target dot check the opposite of that. I think that'll work. So there you go. That's what that's the idea. You know, so this is what it'll look like by default, a little less overwhelming, we might need to actually add a little bit of padding here, I don't know, like above the uh, the checkbox. But then whenever a user's like, hey, I do want to provide more details, boom, okay, we can add more information here. Um, we can test this out. And then we can provide the URL. And then if the user clears that out, if they uncheck that, we should keep the, the state. Like, so if the user changes their mind and comes back, it's still there. But if they uncheck it, we shouldn't send that stuff. That's what's important. Um, all right, so we are done that review. We are done that review. And hopefully that was useful to the contributor. Falgun Islam 12, thank you for your patch. Hopefully this is actionable information. Uh, and again, apologies for everyone else who's ever commented on this uh, uh, Hi, Fal what's what's your name? Falguni Islam. Hi, Fal Falguni Islam. I've left a review on the patch. Let me know if you have any questions on how to proceed. Thanks. Clear. All right. That's one. What else did I want to do today? Uh, well, there were some uh, intermittent test failures that I wanted to look at. You know, I got neat info on a couple of these, and uh, this is a good opportunity to check those out. Oh, yeah. I'm not even the one fixing this. This is a thing. This is a uh, related to some stuff that one of my colleagues is trying to fix. Okay, stretch. I need to like clear the slate, clear my brain slate because this one's gonna be a little complicated. Okay, there is a test failure that occurs in this test, browser delay, autoplay, multiple media. And if I remember correctly, this test uh, this is one of those tests that just makes sure that we don't accidentally play like we we apply the right uh, like autoplay policy to things if there are multiple multiple chunks of media on the page so it like it opens a background tab it loads the page that presumably has some media on it some audio i guess uh the tab it has its like media it's like a background tab so the t the media is auto blocked and then if script tries to start playback, it will fail. And then we switch to it and then that will allow for the audio to play. Okay. And the test is timing out. This was filed two years ago, but the test was timing out because of something. Um, 
tab should be blocked. It times out waiting. Presumably, it, it's times out waiting for something. There's a bunch of uh, comments here. Sheriffs are like, hey, this thing keeps happening. What is going on? Robots checking it out two years ago. Bryce takes a look, redirects to Alistair. Alistair assigns themselves. Resolved incomplete because it started going away. And then it showed up again. Um, more failure logs. This is six months ago. More recent failure log. 41 total failures. Alistair, any updates? We haven't modified this component for a while. Not sure what happened. From the log I captured from the try server, this shows that the document has been resumed before starting playing media, so we should never receive the block of the, the document has been resumed before we started playing media, so we should never receive the block event for the tab. However, the tab should be in the background at that time. So it seems that the document's visibility got changed incorrectly. Uh, do you know if there's any recent change that would affect the document's visibility state? Why would the document become visible even if it's still a background tab? Um, I've tried to reproduce it with Pronosco. Here's the Pronosco trace. And set is background internal, which is explicitly changed the window to foreground, which seems wrong. And it was called from activeness may be changed. And that comes because the browser front end explicitly calls browser doc shell is active equals true. Oh, yes. Yes, I trust Pernosco. Ah, what's going on here? Uh, yes, that's fine. I trust Pernosco. Where am I? Where's the stack? Dump. Of what? Outputs. Test status. Test timed out. Uh, toolbox. Where's the console? Smurfy asks, what is Pronosco? Pronosco is a tool that was developed by some ex mazillions If you're familiar with, um, yeah, Danny Quillen says it's a software with an awful UI. Uh, uh yeah, I, I think no one would disagree that the, the UI is a little rough, but it's an incredibly powerful tool. If you're familiar with RR, Pronosco is from the same people who built RR. RR is a time travel debugger written, uh, Written in Rust, it, you can use it on Linux to do recording of traces and do time travel debugging with GDB effectively. And Pernosco is a web front end to a Pernosco, uh, to an RR recording that allows you to do like deep querying and hopping, hopping around. It's basically a new front end for a, an RR recording. And uh, it's a little bit like you, you can search for every time a function is called and then hop around to all those individual times. Um, if you go to, you can find out more by going to uh, pernosco, pernos.co, fast, fun, omniscient debugging, record failures anywhere, rapidly debug, share your recordings, revolutionary pernosco, omniscient debugger. Um... Check it out. Pricing. Here's the pricing. Um, help them out. Okay, so uh, what are we doing here? So whenever the browser seems to like do a redirect load switch, and then we change remoteness, and then we say that it becomes active. Browser custom element 407. 407. In did change in tab browser, did change event. When the browser changed remoteness, 
this shouldn't really be necessary. It should always set the same value as activeness is correctly preserved across remoteness changes. However, this has the side effect. So this is something that Emilio had added before. Um, and I think I reviewed this. I didn't review this. Let's go back in time and see more about this. Oh, uh, someone wanted a link to the Pernosco. Let me uh, go back. Yeah, here's the link to Pernosco. There you go. Synchronized. Galvanized. And what's interesting about it is like, you actually have a... Uh, you have a full-blown GDB here, and I think you're at the, we're at the state of this state. Like if I P C S T R, I get the string. Um, you can go like back in time, like break N S doc shell internal load. Um, like it's a full-blown debugger here, and I go reverse continue hit internal load. Um, Pretty neat. Um, I'm I'm basically just using this as a front end for RR right now because this is this is RR in here, and that's free. You can just use RR. But the um, yeah, Pernosco link to Pernosco trace link to Pernosco itself. There you go. Anyway, um, what are we doing here? I got distracted. I got distracted like I so easily do. So Emilio had added this thing. And, oh, here, this is important. Switching a browser's remoteness will create a new frame loader. This frame loader start out with an active doc shell. We have to deactivate it if this is not the selected tabs browser or the browser window is minimized. So before we would like, after we f flipped it, this comment got changed. Copy activeness status and replace by instead of handling the consumers. And then, which just assigns the result of this function, which means the tab is probably actually in the foreground. Get the state. The state is loading or loaded. If it is, then it's a bug because we only change it to foreground in near the end of the test. The situation I mentioned was happening before media started playing, which is around here. So they added a tab, loaded it, and this is where the test is failing. Just above, this shows the tab should be in the background. Sorry about again. Do you know my favorite person? Um, I guess I wrote this chunk of code. However, it seems that the tab switcher is confused and thinks it should activate a tab when it really shouldn't. Do you know how that could possibly happen? Well, it decided that it decided that it should activate. the dock shell. There's a, a redirect load switch. So we opened a background tab. It does like a, a process flip because it begins to load a different page. I guess it loads, because it starts by being at about blank and then we load this page. So we do a process flip, I think. And then for some reason, we seem to think that the state is loading or loaded. Uh, 
so let me answer this. Do you know how this could possibly happen? Hmm. In theory, the only way that the tab could be in a state such that um, should activate doc shell returns true is that uh, we entered one of state loading or state loaded. This dot set tab state state loading or state unloaded state loading. when the layers become available. Assert that we're loading or loaded. Is that its layers were requested. Is that we had requested that it send its display list to the compositor. The only, uh, only ways I think this can happen without uh, switching the tab to the foreground is if the tab is being warmed up because the mouse is hovering it. Or It's a browser being used for print preview, which isn't which isn't the case, which isn't happening in this case. I actually like to see a an instance of this test failure. Like I can see a screenshot of one of these test failures. So we can go into one of these comments. And we can pull up one of the more recent uh, instances. I want to get back here so I have my comments still. Um, but then we can pull up the screenshot. Where is the mouse? That's interesting. So it didn't go into the foreground, but it thinks it's in the foreground. What I would recommend, what I'd be interested in, getting is a log from the async tab switcher from this test failure to try to pin down what's happening. How easy is this failure to reproduce? If possible, could um, it's like use dump for logging. Could a uh, try build uh, be pushed that sets this flag to true? The log that produces could help us understand um, how this background tab is pos is being made active when it shouldn't. Okay, I'm going to ask for that from Alistair. All right. So, answer that question. Next question. Uh, there's another intermittent. Let's check it out. 
Intermittent test failures. It's my favorite. It, it's my jam. Uh, you know what would be great is if, like, my camera... I, I What I need is, like, a better camera so that I could, like, really sort of, like, dive across. Like, I just need a wider frame so that, you know, I can just be sitting here and I can, like, reach across. Like, this, this sort of, like, barrier that exists right here. If I can get rid of it and I can just, like, be over here, too. Because I find that I move around a lot. It would probably be nice if I didn't just kind of, like, suddenly slice in half like this. Okay. So what's this test failure about? Intermittent browser, blah, 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 blah. Browser overwrite cache. Found the target element null equals true. Um, this is a test that I added. This is, has to do with the about home startup cache. And let's take a quick peek at uh, a recent failure. Failures have been going up. Looks like a lot of Windows failures. And in this case, it looks like the page never actually loads. Let's take a look at a couple of other instances. Does the page never load? Doesn't load there. Let's just do a, a random sample. Okay, nothing. Now the good news is that we actually get like a really nice log from the about home startup cache, which might help us determine why loading the page is failing. Like that's why the test is failing is that like loading, there's this assertion where it's like, okay, well, I expect to see some content here and uh, we're, we're failing that. Like what's the, uh, what's the actual assertion? It's like found the target element. Um, here, let's actually look at the test and we can see it. So we're actually looking for th this. Um, test ID, test ID. We're looking for this something new header. And it's definitely not loading. Okay, so let's find out why. Let's read the log and see if we can understand what's happening here. So let's open up the raw log. So that's what I prefer. Uh, and we'll go right to the start of the test. Start uh, overwrite cache. Simulating restart of the browser. That happens right here. So we simulate a shutdown write. We never wrote a cache. So then we cache now. We write the cache. This, the whole thing's done. Shutdown writes complete. Startup child uninits. Um, Populating cache. Done writing the cache. Uninitialized. We're done. We completely shut down. And then uh, waiting for a bet home startup cache entry. Got a bet home startup cache. Ensuring cache bytes are available. Then we're in. Where does this stuff come from? Waiting for a bet home startup cache entry. I think that's from the test itself. Yeah. In like in the simulate restart thing we wait for the cache entry that's where the stuff is written to we're waiting for that to show up we get it we ensure that there are bytes available then we initialize against so we construct pipes we retrieve the the cache entry and we show the version all good waiting for about home to load received usage result um, is that what simulate restart does? Does it actually like waiting for about home to load? Yes, and then it loads. Okay, so we finished uh, simulating the restart. Success is true. About home loaded, and then we populate the cache and we doom the old entry. And we're doing that with this inject into cache thing. So about home cache head. What does this do? Writes a page string and string, script string into the cache for the next about home load. The way that works is we ensure that there's a cache entry. Uh, and then we get, 
we create some streams and then we call in to populate cache. Populating the cache, doing the old entry. We clear the cache, opening the page output stream, writing the page cache, writing the page data is complete. Now opening the script output stream, writing the script cache. Now, do we complete this? Writing the script cache. That we're missing. Do we never, I guess we never say that it's done. Writing the script cache. This happens in browser glue.jsm. We should say writing the script cache is done setting version, but we never do. Oh, wait. Writing the script cache, and then we rest restart, and then we say writing the script cache is done. That seems wrong. This seems out of order. Let's actually see if we can find an instance where this test runs where the order is correct. So what I'm gonna suggest is we go to, um, actually we can do it ourselves. If we run this test ourselves, mock, moki test, um, browser overwrite cache, .js headless. Scoop do. Okay. So. Da ba da ba da. Never wrote the cache. Arm the thingy. Shut her down. It's uninited. Okay. Then we init. Then we populate the cache. We wrote the script cache. So interestingly, we do the same thing here where we simulate the restart of the browser, intentionally skipping shutdown right, waiting for about a home startup cache child to uninit, and then we say that writing the script cache is done. Populate cache is finished. That's weird. Like, is that maybe the race? Like, populate cache, you'd think. Async, we await a promise. It should resolve here. And then populate cache is finished. Await, pop, async, populate cache. And then for some reason, we're, we like simulate the restart of the browser. Like, is inject into cache not awaiting properly? Populate cache, await for it. I mean, maybe we're rejecting? Are we rejecting? I guess that's possible, but then you'd expect it to like throw an exception. Failed to write to write, failed to write page to output stream. I guess that's possible. Except no, 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 that, that's not what's happening. We, we eventually get to here. We must. Is it possible that the logging tool is out of order? This.log equals what? logger basic console appender 
if I use dump appender. I wonder if the console is buffered. In which case, I can understand it being slightly out of order. In which case, this might also be a bit of a red herring that we're on. Intentionally skipping. Populate cache is finished. Yeah, here we go. Dooming old entry. So the this is the right order right here. And the reason that I guess it was appearing out of order over here was because the console is it's reordering things between dump and the console all right that's not super great but i guess we can ignore that that's not the issue at least i don't think it's the issue so this is a little not not great but we can assume populate cache is finished then we simulate restart the browser uninitialized caching page script is done Pop populate cache is finished and then uninitialized. It's uninited. Waiting for the cache entry. Got it. Waiting for bet home to load. Initted. Constructed pipes. Cat. Blah blah blah. We get it. Privileged. Uh, oh, here. This is interesting. Then the content process launches. I think that's actually not unusual. That's what we want. Yeah, launching with ID two. ID one in this case. I guess it's okay. Sending input streams, page, connect the pipe, received usage result. Success is false. Aha. Received usage result. Um, that's going to be from about new tab service. The usage result comes from here. Success is false. I don't think we're ensuring that bytes are available, are we? Version retrieve. Cache entry is available. Anything? Ensure cache wins race. I don't think we're doing this part. Why aren't we doing this part? Ensure cash wins race. It should default to true unless we're intentionally saying, oh, no. Um, simulate restart. Second argument should be this. Oh, what's going on here? I. I that's the problem. We need to be like uh, using the right arguments here, yo. With auto shutdown right, false. And, sh and then like we should ensure the cache wins the race. And that's the default. Expect timeout false. I think that's our problem here. So we should expect to see uh, a new couple of logging lines in here about ensuring the cache wins the race. Wait, 
play for about hold on, an hour four similarly intentionally skipping waiting for it to uninit Do we somehow not enter here? Not if knitted, why would we not be knitted? Start cache init. Under initialized. Uh, I'm just a little confused. Init it, get init it, return. Why would that have failed? So uninitted, and then initting, sending input stream. Oh, initialized here, initialized. So it did get initted. Oh, okay, sorry. Waiting for about home startup cache entry. Yeah, 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 got about home cache entry. Why is ensure cache wins race not doing the thing? Ensuring cache wins race should be true. Like if I say this. and cash bytes are available yeah, yeah yeah so that's what i want so i this might be a case of me not understanding how default args works with javascript because i thought whenever you do stuff like this you're setting default arguments let's do a quick test let's do a quick test how does de well, jsbin.com how do default arguments work Uh, I don't even think I need to go to jsbin.com. I can just do it here. So function, um, and then the, what was I doing? Like a, b, c. And if nothing is set, then I want, oh, then I want a to be one, b to be two, and c to be three. And then my function, it's just going to log a, b, and c. What function statement? Function test func. Okay, test func. Call it one, two, three. Makes sense. If I say a zero, aha, uh -huh. that's the problem. That's the problem. If you supply any one of them, the other ones don't have their default values set arg um what's the right pattern javascript named arguments object uh, object approach stack overflow time with defaults with defaults you do it this way Interesting. So like console dot log name age my funk default user NA my funk name test test NA that's what we want Mike age one hundred undefined you get NA nothing that's what we want. I did it wrong. That's the problem. Ah! Okay, so 
the format for uh, default arguments should actually be with auto shutdown write equals true. Ensure cache wins race equals true. And then uh, expect timeout equals false. And then this. I guess that is the actual, that's what's expected. Let's see what Prettier thinks. Prettier happy with that? That's wild that Prettier is happy with that. Can we do better? Like, I can't believe, like, come on. Okay, that's what it wants. Um, so now if I run this, we should be ensuring bytes. Yes, we are. So now what I think we should do is rerun the entire suite components, new tab, test browser, about home start cache. Let's run the whole suite. And then uh, we should check to see every other usage of simulate restart because looks like I may not have updated every single version of it that was using the old argument style. Bew, 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 bew. Failures. Yeah, this is so uh, with auto shutdown. Um, there were a bunch of places where I didn't use this right. With auto shutdown right should be false. Um, so that should fix browser bump version, right? One forty four, rather. Wait for condition. Try. This should definitely be available. Will return. Uh, we'll throw an exception. Um, bytes weren't available. Keep polling. So, yeah, I believe if we try and get available, like a, on an input stream. SI input stream. Come on. Page stream. SI input stream available. Throws if the stream was closed normally. Stream is closed to some error condition. Stream is added in file but not closed. Return zero bytes available. Non blocking stream does not have any da data. We should return zero. It must not throw wood block. Um, stream wasn't available. Hmm. Wait. Test that if the version on the cache entry doesn't match the expectation that we ignore the cache and load the dynamic about home document. Pre-existing cache exists. And then we... Shut down right. Uh, we're going to... Oh, right. We can actually not do this. What we need to do is not ensure the cache wins the race. That's what we need to do. We don't 
need to shut down right or ensure the cash wins the race since we expect the cash to be blown away because the version number has been bumped. So that, that should be fine. Great. So what were the other failures? Um, bump version and then So all just bump version. What were the other usages of simulate restart? About home. So most of them just use the defaults and then we did one modification for bump version already. Browser locale change, browser locale change. Simulate restart with, what was it? Shutdown right with auto shut down right false clear if the app locale changes mm. don't uh, write the don't accidentally overwrite the cache pre-existing cache Uh, don't accidentally write the cache on shutdown for the test. No, I guess it doesn't really matter. And then browser no cache. Wow. And here's another place where uh, this whole thing is like where types would have been really helpful. Test that there's no cache written that we load the dynamic about home document at the startup. Yeah. Uh, browser overwrite cache. That's the one we were working with. And then browser same consumer. Um, simulate restart. With auto shut down right. Browser sanitize. All right, these look okay. And that's the definition. Okay, so now let's run the whole suite. Feels good. Um, I uh, So TLDR on this one, when I modified some tests, a test uh, function, I didn't actually update all of the callers and I wasn't actually using like default named parameter pattern correctly in JavaScript. And um, you know, JavaScript's just happy to accept false instead of an object. And that all blew up in my face. And so the root, oh, that's a little cal change. I guess we are not expecting some streams in those cases. Ensure cash wins race false. Yeah. Uh, browser no cache. Ensure cache wins race false. Browser sanitize. We didn't modify that one. Should we have? Oh. Let's simulate restart. Ensure cache wins race false. All right. Running, 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 running. Okay. 
Uh, we're going to revert the dump appender change here. Um, we're going to update maybe some comments for each of these. So browser sanitize here. We're going to say, since we're um, blowing away the cache, we don't want to write to it on shutdown. We don't want the system to write a new one. We don't want for the purpose since we're blowing away the cat for the purposes of the test. We don't want the write on shutdown behavior here. So we uh, because we just want to test what it's like to uh, test that the cache doesn't exist on startup if the history data was cleared. We also therefore don't need to ensure that the not of the cache wins the race. Um, okay, that's one. Has our same consumer. The page loads the stream script. I'll have load the page stream that will fail and get the default non cached. If a page attempts to load the script stream without having also loaded the page stream, it will fail. Yeah. Um, I guess we don't need the script that sets a cache consumer pride true on the window. I'm going to test and show that if we try to load the script cache from a different browser context, then this property is not set. Okay, that's fine. We want to keep, we do want to wait for the cache to be available. All right. Um, overwrite cache. In this case, yeah, we, we, we don't want to overwrite here. We have browser, no cache. We d we don't need to sim um, because we're testing the no cache case. So bypass the we bypass the automatic writing of the cache on shutdown, and we also don't need to wait for the cache to be available. Locale change. We're testing. Um, we're testing that switching locales b blows away the cache. So we bypass the automatic writing of the cache on shutdown. We also need, need to wait cash to be available. Okay. I am happy with this patch. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new commit and I'm going to assign myself to this one. Take bug such and such uh, fix some broken about home uh, some busted tests for the about home startup cache let's see if Amy feels up to reviewing this Amy what is your um, church role what is your fabricator account name one sec Is it just Amy? It's just Amy. Okay. So 
r equals 80. And we should go into more detail on this. Also, does this need like any prettier action? Mock, lint, browser components, new tab, test browser, about home cache. Not line, lint. And then I'm going to end the stream before I post this up, uh, just after I post this for review. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm going to write a, um, I'm going to write a uh, quick comment to try and make it uh, more clear what I'm doing in here. Come on, linting. Oh, uh, while I'm waiting for this, I can quickly answer some questions. The first one's not actually a question. It's more of a, a request. A person, someone wrote in, is like, I'd like a part two of this episode. This, so my last episode, I did sort of a deep dive into doc shells and browsing contexts. And they write, I'd like a part two of this episode where you explain how add-ons or web extensions interact with all of the doc shells, Chrome content, etc." Okay. Um... I can I can try doing that. Uh, oh, here we go. Yeah, fix them up. Fix that up, then. Don't just complain. Fix it up. So yeah, I could try and do that. Uh, if people would be interested in that, just let me know. Use the rate this episode link. Tell me whether or not this person's idea would be interesting, because I'll do it. And the second question is, how did you learn to be a mentor? Well, the, uh, the answer is I was mentored by people and I paid attention to what they were doing for me. And, you know, I think about what a person, like a mentoring is all about thinking about what another person needs, paying very close attention to what they need. Don't just, and, and not giving them the answers, but giving them tools to like find answers, to grow them, you know. Uh, it's tempting sometimes to want to just sort of like get out of the, you know, push someone out of the way and just take over the keyboard and say there I, I did it for you just to get the thing done but you know a person needs the opportunity to grow themselves and so giving someone guidance for how they can stretch and grow and build themselves up to build their confidence um i think that i pay attention to that sort of thing like is something a, an opportunity for someone to stretch their understanding and flex their muscles and and like their brain muscles and grow a bit and if so, like give them that opportunity. Um, you know, that that's what I recommend. So this should now, if I remember correctly, if I understand correctly, this should have fixed some things with linting and then I can update the commit message. I'll push this up for review. Uh, Amy can take a look at it and then we can call it a day. Call it a day. Yeah, uh, hg commit amend. So when did I accident, where did I uh, simulate restart? I must have added this like, yeah, add some tests. Make sure about shutdown is used for tests that expected. Back in June, I think. Hmm. Simulate restart. Yeah. Fine. When the tests for the about home startup cache were first introduced, I made a mistake. I used the wrong format for um, default argument, default named arguments. In JavaScript, I made I made a few mistakes. Um, one, I used the wrong format for default named arguments in JavaScript. I accidentally used uh, named arg one, named arg two, 
equals uh, named arg1 default1 named arg2 default2 uh, instead of and it should be uh, named arg1 equals default1 named arg2 equals default2 equals two and then two um, I would some of the tests we're passing a boolean as the second argument to simulate restart which is not correct which is not expected um, this caused uh, a whole host of issues including some tests not waiting for the uh, cache to be ready when uh, not waiting for the cache to be ready when doing the simulation the restart simulation the two is what ultimately caused the intermittent failure for bug 16488 Eight, six. Uh, the test was failing to wait in some in, in certain in some cases uh, there sometimes the about home startup cache would win the race uh, and the cache data would be available and sometimes it would lose the race. Um, uh, lose the race. Now we correctly wait for the cache to be available before proceeding with the test so that the cache wins every time okay let's submit and we'll call it a day hey thank you so much for watching episode 200 and something 265 of the joy of coding i hope that was interesting uh, maybe next week we'll do this thing where we talk about add-ons and web extensions and how they latch on to various doc shells and browsing contexts and stuff. I actually don't know that stuff myself. We can figure it out together. Um, let me know what you thought of this episode. Use this form to rate the episode. You can ask me questions. You can let me know what I can do to make this stream better for you. Um, tell your friends. And with that, I think I'm going to call it. So thanks again for watching. Have yourselves a great week. Take care. Bye bye. The joy of coding. See ya.